that this chemical is, I think, the primary reason why the U.S. healthcare system is in such a mess. You know, we have by far the most expensive healthcare system in the world, and we're getting really bad results in terms of life expectancy and all the different chronic diseases that we suffer from. Our healthcare system is failing, and you know, if we appreciate the fact that it's failing because we're really sick, because we're being poisoned all the time, it makes a lot more sense, really. Well, hello everyone. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Welcome again to The Empowering Neurologist. Thanks for joining us. We're going to have an interesting discussion today about a, a topic that is really quite polarized uh, in our modern health-related society, and that is the safety of glyphosate. Glyphosate is the active ingredient. It's an herbicide active ingredient in products like Roundup that people may use around their homes to get rid of weeds, but more importantly, 150 million tons of glyphosate are applied to uh, the crops in America that we we then consume. You know, it's been estimated then that that's one pound of glyphosate each year for every single person living in the United States. So there are certainly individuals who want us to believe that glyphosate is safe. Most of them uh, have uh, some connection with industry. And then there are certainly those who are calling out glyphosate as being a powerful health threat, uh, one of whom is Dr. Stephanie Seneff from MIT, who's written a new book that we're going to talk about today called Toxic Legacy, How the Weed Killer Glyphosate is Destroying Our Health and the Environment. She's got a lot of data that we're going to talk about. She's going to describe for us the mechanisms by which glyphosate is threatening, how it affects the microbiome, how it acts as a chelating agent, a lot of different things that glyphosate does, how persistent it is in the environment, how it gets into not just the foods that we eat, but our drinking water and even the air that we breathe. Very interesting discussion. Uh, put your seatbelts on for this one. So uh, here we go. Hello, Dr. Seneff. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. How about yourself? Doing very well. Uh, just finished reading your book. I want to um, first thank you for taking the time to be with us. Thank you for the effort that it must have taken to create uh, this uh, work. I, I think it's very, very important. I, I want to do everything we can to get as much of this information out to the world because I think it's so darn important. I'd like to start off, if we could, uh, by just asking you how how did you get started on uh, your interest in glyphosate? I know you talk about it in the book, but I want to share that with our viewers. Yes, I mean, it's quite interesting, really. I, I got interested in autism, actually, way back when I had my best friend at the time had a child who, a young child who got a DPT shot, ran a high fever, had a um, seizures a week later, and um, was later diagnosed with autism. Kind of planted a seed in my mind about autism, you know, when the child was severely uh, disabled. Um, many, many years later, 2006, 2007, I was watching the numbers go up. They were going up exponentially. They still are. So it's very um, nerve. It's very sobering to think about the rates we're going to have in another 10, 15 years uh, if we just keep doing this. So autism is a very serious problem, and the government doesn't seem to want to pay attention to it. They seem to think it's just, you know, we're diagnosing it more. Or, they, they, they're ignoring the problem, and I wanted to figure out what was causing it. So around 2007, 2008, I looked into the vaccines quite deeply, as well as into all kinds of other chemicals in the environment. I uh, didn't think of looking at glyphosate because it's safe. Everybody knows it's safe. It's Roundup. You know, you don't think about it. Um, but it was just fortuitous, and I was sort of frustrated because I was learning a lot about autism, its relationship to the gut dysbiosis and the mineral uh, imbalances and deficiencies and toxicities. I mean, it was clearly... Things were messed up in the in the autism uh, way. The kids, the metabolism of the autistic kids is really disturbed. And and I thought something's got to be doing this, and I just don't know what it is. And that was just by chance that I happened to be at a conference where Professor Don Huber was giving a talk on glyphosate. This is in 2012, I think September 2012. He was a retired. He is a retired professor from Purdue University, an expert in plant pathology and plant physiology. And he was warning the world about this chemical that we've been overlooking that's much more dangerous than we thought. And he gave this two-hour presentation and talked about the soil bacteria, the gut bacteria, the same thing, you know, messing them up, the chelating the minerals and preventing them from being taken up appropriately in the plant, in the human. So he was always drawing the analogies between what's happening in the plant, what's happening in our body, 
And um, he basically laid out the missing links for all the things I was looking at. I was thinking maybe these kids are getting a lot of antibiotics and they're messing up their gut. Well, glyphosate is a patented antimicrobial agent. So, you know, it just fit like hand in glove. And I, I was just amazed by that presentation. And I immediately dropped everything else I was doing and just started reading everything I could about glyphosate and then everything I could about the diseases that are correlated with glyphosate and just started building the story. And I've never stopped since then. It's just been an amazing journey. And I'm more convinced than ever that I'm right at this point. And it's just, you know, astonishing that we could let a chemical like that go on for 40 years, 45 years, and not notice that, it, you know, it's a primary cause. It's not the only cause. We have lots of chemicals. I'm not saying it causes everything, but it is a major player. And mostly because it's um, considered safe. People use it carelessly. People can use it in their lawn on the dandelions while the child's playing. They don't really think much of it because... They don't realize it's toxic, but it's also all over the food supply. And we love it because it makes our food so cheap. And uh, we've got this whole setup now with the way we do agriculture that's going to be very difficult to unravel. So we're kind of in a bind once we acknowledge that this chemical is, I think, the primary reason why the U.S. healthcare system is in such a mess. You know, we have by far the most expensive healthcare system in the world. And we're getting really bad results in terms of life expectancy and all the different chronic diseases that we suffer from. Our health care system is failing. And, you know, if we appreciate the fact that it's failing because we're really sick, because we're being poisoned all the time, it makes a lot more sense, really. Well, Gregory Bateson once said that man uh, is the only animal who will befoul his own nest, a sure sign of madness. And I kept uh, thinking about that quote as I was reading your book. We had a lot to uh, we had a lot to dig into and lay some groundwork here. And you opened with autism. I think for our viewers, they're uh, probably pretty used to uh, our discussions of the relationships between what goes on in the gut uh, and uh, autism. That there are obvious measurable changes in short chain fatty acids. There are obvious right. fingerprints that take that are available of what the the microbiome bacteria specifically look like what happens to specific species in the group Clostridia, for example. Uh, we've talked in the past about, at least in the animal model, reversing symptoms of autism by using b the work of Dr. Elaine Asau at uh, UCLA. But let's just uh, very carefully talk about um, glyphosate, uh, which apparently affects only plants and not human cells. So I really want you to go through that. <laughs> that was the messaging right. that opened the door for glyphosate being safe for one and all. Let's use it around the globe. Let's modify the seeds to make them roundup resistant uh, because glyphosate doesn't affect human cells. Right. I mean, that was the line that we were given. And that sounds so beautiful. We don't have the pathway. We don't have the enzyme. So there's a specific enzyme and a specific biological pathway really important to basically all the plants. And uh, we don't have any of that in our cells. They don't have the genes for it. They can't make that protein. So how can we possibly be affected by glyphosate? It's so wonderful because it's specific to this plant enzyme that we don't have. And of course, what you overlook is that our gut microbes have that enzyme, use that enzyme to make essential amino acids for us, the aromatic amino acids, which are so important, not just for building proteins, which of course would be enough already, but they're also the precursors to so many important biologically active molecules, uh, including all the neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, melatonin, the skin tanning agent, melanin, thyroid hormone, B vitamins, and then there's also all kinds of um, exotic um, molecules that the plants make that are, uh, that are beneficial to our health. When you eat a plant-based diet, you get all these wonderful polyphenols and flavonoids. Those things all come out of that pathway too. So it messes up the, the, the nutritional value of the foods that we eat. Um, and then it also messes up our gut microbiome, which then disturbs so much of our metabolism. And then we just get completely out of whack with so many different metabolic pathways. So let me just, if, if I can uh, step that down just a little bit. The message we were given was that this shikimate pathway, which is what glyphosate targets in plants to get rid of weeds, uh, isn't an issue for humans because our cells don't contain that pathway that the glyphosate can disrupt. However, what you just told us was that bacteria that live within us that we depend upon to make our B vitamins and our neurotransmitters and to maintain the integrity of our gut lining just happen to have that pathway 
that is disrupted by this weed killer. And therefore, it really does represent a threat to us through that mechanism. That's right. And of course, not only does it disrupt their ability to supply those things for us, but it disrupts them. So you have the particularly sensitive microbes, which are the lactobacillus and the bifidobacteria. Those two are really, you know, the primary bacteria that get a, a whole, you know, they, they, they take over the gut in the infant gut. The infant gut originally used to be almost all bifidobacteria back in the day when they were just drinking um, breast milk. And I wrote about that in my book. It was quite amazing. Back 1920, 1930, when they looked at the analyze, they had almost pure bifidobacteria. And, but now they don't. I mean, they have all these other microbes because the bifidobacteria are really, really hurt by glyphosate. And there was a lovely paper that showed that. And they looked at all these different microbes and bifidobacteria were practically completely wiped out by the glyphosate in the experiments that they did. Whereas other uh, you know, pathogens like salmonella and clostridia are much more sturdy against glyphosate. And so they get an edge and then they overgrow in the gut and get the, you know, get the inflammation, the leaky gut, all this follows. Your immune cells get in there and start doing stuff and messing you up, you know, and, and things get out of balance. So what you said in the book is that the research uh, makes it clear that the good bacteria, if we can make that con uh, conclusion here, that good or healthful or um, bacteria that are doing good things for our gut, like maintaining the gut lining, are more uh, sensitive to glyphosate as opposed to pathogens. So we're really selecting out bad bacteria when we are exposed to glyphosate. But hey, I'm not exposed to glyphosate, am I? <laughs> I wish it were true. <laughs> You'd have to live on a different planet, I think. And, you know, maybe Bhutan. I've so been, had my eye on Bhutan as a possible place to move to because they're mostly organic. They're still you know, eating the kind of food we used to grow back in, in the early 1900s without, without chemicals. I mean, it's very few countries that aren't. You know, America is a leader. We, we consume 20% of the world's glyphosate with 4% of the world's population. So we get much more here per person than almost any place else in the world. Brazil might be a close second, but we're the worst. Interesting. And when we look at uh, urine evaluations of uh, broad spectrums of population, what do we find in terms of the percentage of individuals who actually show evidence of glyphosate? I think it's probably quite high, and I don't know the actual percentage numbers, but you know there have been some studies that have come out, and they've, there have been studies that have very clearly linked the glyphosate. I'm actually really surprised that they could see the signal in simply doing urine tests, like you know a urine test on a population. And there's one study, I can give you a couple examples, and one of them was um, liver disease. And so glyphosate is clearly causing fatty liver disease, which is an epidemic today going up dramatically. And, um, and, they, and, and a study has shown that with rats, with, with our levels of glyphosate exposure below regulatory limits, rats developed fatty liver disease in one of the experiments that they did. Humans, they had this uh, group of people they studied, they, had, they put them into three categories, uh, severe fatty liver disease, milder cases of fatty liver disease, and no fatty liver disease, three categories. And they found a statistically significant difference. Uh, between the levels of glyphosate in the urine of the people who were, had the fatty disease versus the ones who didn't. And even within that group, the extreme cases versus the lesser cases, there was a statistically significant difference in the level of glyphosate in the urine. I was quite surprised by that because the urinary levels are measuring mostly what's happened over the last couple of weeks. So, you know, if you've it's probably got a lot of variability. So I was uh, uh, suspecting the noise would be too high to see the signal, but that was not the case. And there's another study that just came out, amazing study in my opinion. They looked at pregnant women and they measured the amount of glyphosate in the urine um, in the mid-pregnancy, I think around four months time frame. They measured the amount of uh, glyphosate in the urine of these pregnant women. And then they have a test, and I didn't know about this test, but there's a test you can look at the genitals of a, of a girl a baby girl, and you can measure a distance. You know, it's called the ano, uh, ano uh, urinary. <laughs> it's the distance between the, um, the anogenital distance. There you go. Specific AG. measure, and that measure apparently links to uh, testosterone exposure in utero. And then they found the correlation between the amount of glyphosate and the uh, and that distance in these baby girls. And that uh, having a, a big, a long distance, which means excess testosterone exposure during uh, pregnancy is linked uh, very strongly linked to polycystic ovary syndrome, and that is a, a, a another epidemic that we're facing right now. So many women are having trouble getting pregnant because of this uh, PCOS, which often messes up your periods. You know, it's, it's a very big disruptor of your endocrine balance that you see as an adult, 
manifested by the exposure to testosterone, testosterone in utero. It's quite fascinating. And it's a clear link because glyphosate disrupts cytochrome P450 enzymes. That's been shown in rat studies. And aromatase is a cytochrome P450 enzyme, and that's the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. So it's extremely clear how this would happen given glyphosate exposure. So it all makes sense, you know, but it's... Um, I mean, you did a wonderful job in, in at least uh, mechanistically laying that out, that, uh, that glyphosate does affect aromatase and as such would, uh, could lead to this uh, hormonal disruption that you talk about with ever-increasing uh, incidence of PCOS we see in our society, now the number one cause of infertility. Right. Uh, and uh, with clear evidence as well that uh, there's a strong... A microbiome, a microbiome disruption that's really quite common. Uh, and interestingly, uh, that may just have a metabolic play as well. We've seen some preliminary reports that reestablishing uh, glucose sensitivity via a ketogenic diet has some uh, mm -hmm. role to play there. And it takes us back, and the relationship I, I would just offer up is the role of, of a good uh, balance of organisms in the gut as it relates to metabolism. We know that there's certainly dysbiosis that is characteristic of insulin resistance of type 2 diabetes with actual interventional research now treating type 2 diabetes, at least uh, one researcher in Amsterdam, uh, using fecal microbial transplant mm -hmm. with success, reported success. So it really is a powerful connection to the gut uh, and the microbes with the damage to these organisms, the, particularly the, the health, healthful ones, based upon targeting that shikimate pathway that they contain uh, with glyphosate. But there's another, uh, before we drop that, before we get to the chelating aspects of glyphosate, let's just talk a little bit more about the relationship through the microbiome uh, and gut permeability and immune stimulation to the ever-increasing uh, incidence of autoimmune conditions. I mean, it's been right. estimated that as many as 60 to 80 million Americans have been diagnosed with a bona fide autoimmune condition. Uh, we've talked on this program before about underlying uh, chronic infections like Lyme uh, and other issues that may relate, but I think uh, you, you have a, a card to play as it relates to this hand. Absolutely, yes, and I think it has to do with, in part, with uh, certainly glyphosate, but glyphosate messing up the body's ability to metabolize proteins. It starts with that. And, um, and that's partly the, the gut microbes because the lactobacillus that I mentioned earlier, they have several different enzymes that specialize in, in separating proline from the other amino acids in the chain. So uh, casein and gluten are both ha have a lot of proline. Proline is a difficult amino acid. to it, it's very, um, it, it doesn't want to detach. And you need specialized enzymes to, to pull it away from the other amino acids in the chain. And these uh, lactobacillus have all these specialized enzymes that we don't have. So we rely on the lactobacillus to help us to break down the casein in milk and the gluten in wheat. And so when the lactobacillus are being killed by glyphosate, which they are severely affected by glyphosate, um, they can't do that. And so those proteins don't get broken down. So you have these peptide sequences that survive the di digestive process. And those things are very uh, allergenic. So it, it causes a the gut to react by producing zonulin, which is a, uh, an enzyme that opens up the gut barrier. And there's actually a paper, a couple of papers, showing that glyphosate causes this uh, up, you know, upregulation of zonulin in the gut, which opens up the barrier and causes what's called a leaky gut. Um, the, the cells separate from each other, things can get through the cracks. And in particular, these peptide sequences that didn't get digested can get through the cracks. Of course, the microbes can too. So you get sort of stuff going into the blood that isn't supposed to be there. And this causes uh, an alar alarm bells in the immune system. So the immune cells, cells start attacking these proteins and they develop antibodies to these peptide sequences. And then through this process called molecular mimicry, where um, the sequence in the bacterial, you know, whatever the, the, the protein, whatever protein in the food or from the bacteria that the, um, that the immune cells are reacting to um, has a sequence that is very similar to a sequence in a human protein. And then the immune cells that develop those specific antibodies, they have, they're nearsighted. They don't quite recognize this isn't quite the right sequence. Sometimes it's actually exactly the same, the sequence. But even with a few you know, errors, it looks enough like the other one that it binds to that too. But that happens to be some important human protein 
And when it does that, attacks that protein, then it can cause a lot of nasty diseases that are autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis and celiac disease and Hashimoto's thyroiditis and lupus and all those things. To name, to name a few. Um, the sequence was that uh, they developed this, um, that glyphosate was developed originally patented as a chelating agent for, for uh, pipes that carried water. Uh, then ultimately it was found it could be, or not ultimately, but it was found that it was a powerful herbicide. And then even after that, uh, it, because based upon its ability to kill bacteria, it was actually patented as, a, as an antibiotic. Uh, but, but having said that, the sequence then was such that Monsanto believed that uh, to vertically integrate, they would create plants uh, that could be sprayed with glyphosate that would not be damaged. And therefore, farmers could spray their crops uh, with this weed killer. The crop, the soy, whatever it would be, would survive, and yet the weeds would die. Sounds like an amazing business plan to me. Uh, but that said, there is this sense that you know people will say, well, GMO foods are safe. There's never been any uh, real uh, science to indicate that there's something wrong with GMO foods, but doesn't that um, kind of just sort of sidestep the whole glyphosate story? I totally think that. In fact, when I first started studying glyphosate, then I was aware there were all these acti activists against GMOs, and I felt like they were missing the boat because the GMOs are enabling the use of the chemicals, and it's the chemicals that are the big problem. I'm not saying the GMOs in and of themselves are harmless, but I think the glyphosate is far more dangerous than the GMOs that are designed to, uh, to, to protect the plant from it. The actual GMO engineering is not nearly as damaging to our health as the effect that it has to allow the plant to be exposed to the chemical. And the amazing thing is, so first of all, when they studied glyphosate to see if it was safe, they studied it in isolation. They have all these extra things they add to it in the formulation. It makes it much more able to get into the cells, much more toxic. And number two, when they studied the GMOs to see if they were safe, they studied them without exposing them to glyphosate. I was really shocked when I read that. They, they knew that if they exposed them to glyphosate, they'd be toxic. So they said, well, we'll just grow these things organically. And then, you know, sure enough, they didn't seem to have a problem. But, you know, they missed the, the reason why they're toxic. They totally left it out of the experiment. I, I, I highlighted that in, in the book with a big asterisk because, again, uh, to show that the GMO plants uh, feeding them to animals was safe, they, they did exactly what you said. They didn't spray them with glyphosate, and that's the issue. They, did, they somehow felt that was, they wanted to have a good study, so they didn't right, spray them. Right, very pure. With, Just question, the question is, is the GMO safe? It doesn't, it's not asking the question, is the glyphosate you're using on the GMO safe, you know? And I suspect they knew the glyphosate wasn't safe, but they didn't want to find that out. So they didn't want to formally find it out. So is non-GMO necessarily going to tell you that there is no glyphosate residues on the wheat, for example? <laughs> That's a loaded question, isn't it? You I know, it, you know it is. I'm reading the witness here. <laughs> yeah, the wheat is amazing. And, and actually, you know, when I started seeing the celiac disease and I was thinking it was going up, I was thinking, oh, my God, that's probably glyphosate. And I knew it wasn't. You know, wheat has never been. And they have a GMO wheat, but the farmers refuse to use it. And I was, you know, so I was kind of puzzled. How are they getting glyphosate in the wheat? And then I realized, I, I looked and I found that they spray the wheat with uh, glyphosate right before the harvest to kill it. They, they do it as a, as a desiccant. It works very well, especially if you're up north. So Canada probably uses this technique more than we do. They're fa facing a frost, you know. They've got to grab the crop before it gets ruined by the frost. They can accelerate the rate at which it matures and they can get those seeds to come out when they spray it with glyphosate. The, the plant, as a last gasp, it goes to seed synchronizes the harvest so everything goes to seed at the same time increases the yield and then it also makes the stubble easier to clear because it just kind of kills it quickly and it dries out that's why it's called a desiccating agent works great you know the trouble is this that the glyphosate goes right into the seed and you get really high levels of glyphosate in those crops that have been sprayed right before harvest it's, of course it's very recent you know right before the, the seed is uh, is taken as food is when it's getting all that glyphosate added to it. So you get actually much higher levels on average of glyphosate contamination in these non-GMO foods that are sprayed right before harvest. And that's been shown experimentally. And again, you know, the, the, a take home here uh, for our viewers is, yeah, it's non-GMO whatever. They say, it says it right on the label. But that's not a guarantee that it's glyphosate free or that absolutely uh, not. No, it's it because be glyphosate is used as a drying agent. But what about if it says certified organic? 
It's much better, but it's still not a guarantee that it's free. And they're not allowed to use glyphosate. So if they're following the rules, they're not putting glyphosate on those certified organic crops. However, glyphosate's in the rain. It could be a neighboring farm where they're spraying it, and drift is going to bring it over. So it's impossible in this country, I think, to to guarantee that there's no glyphosate in your crop, even when you are being conscientious about not using it. Probably the manure as well, because I don't know, I don't think they require organic manure for organic crops. So if you're using manure that's derived from cows that are getting lots of glyphosate, you're probably getting it in the manure. Circle of poison. Let's, I, we, I know you didn't really cover cancer very much in the book, uh, and uh, there was plenty else to talk about. But I think we, to be fair, let's let's just go with uh, D. Wayne Johnson here for oh, just a moment. Oh, I'd love to. Yes. And uh, tell us his story. Yeah, it was very sad, actually. He um, so he's a lovely man. I've met him in person. He's got a lovely family, um, young family, bo- young boys. And um, he was in his forties when he was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. His job was to uh, manage schoolyards in in California. And he controlled the weeds in the schoolyards. And these are children's schoolyards, right, by using glyphosate to control the weeds. So that's already, you know, like, oh, my God, glyphosate, you know, with the children. But so he was using that glyphosate. It was the only chemical he used in his job. And he had had some trouble with his um, equipment. So he had gotten actually a lot of, he'd gotten sprayed with glyphosate in some incidents where the equipment wasn't working properly. So he had had very clear evidence of glyphosate exposure and really no evidence of exposure to any other chemical. A lot of the times the farmers are exposed to so many chemicals, each company blames the other chemical as the reason why they're sick, and they all get off the hook, and that's a game they play. But here, there weren't any other chemicals, and that's part of why it was a very powerful story. And um, and it was a jury trial, and the jury awarded him a, a really a lot of money. And most of it was damages because uh, of Monsanto lying about their product and and so um that was a huge part of the um of the award and it was something like well, I've 283 million it's just, uh, it's been a while it, it was been a reduced i think to what was it 23 yeah, million or it something it kept getting reduced it, uh, it got reduced immediately by the judge through some kind of rule you know regular rule about california's laws and then it's been an appeal you know these these cases never end there've been three now big uh, cases with four people. One of them was a couple, both of whom had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. There was Hardiman, who, the, the Hardiman, I think was his name, the second case, and he just recently had a, they went to trial on an upper court and Monsanto lost. That's just brand new news. I just heard about that. Hardiman, Hardiman or something like that, the second case. But now and the World couple, Health Organization actually has gone forward and characterized uh, glyphosate as a probable human Carcinogen, have they it, not? It, yeah, it's the um, IARC, uh, it, it, <laughs> International Agency for Research in Cancer, I think, IARC, which is part of the WHO. And they declared uh, glyphosate a probable carcinogen actually back in 2015. And I think that's why these cases, why the lawyers even dare to take these cases to court, because it's always been the company works very hard to make sure papers don't get published that, that you know show, show their product in bad light. And as long as those papers aren't published, the lawyers don't have a legal case. And so there's so a game Dr. of... Fenef, the, the World Health Organization, uh, or a, a part thereof, has declared glyphosate a probable human carcinogen such that we are still using 150 million tons on, <laughs> uh, on our crops in America uh, each year. Uh, equi- equivalent to one pound of glyphosate per uh, right. human living in the United States. So I, I'm trying to labor through that disconnect. The World Health Organization is saying this is likely, going, likely causing cancer. Dr. Stephanie Seneff is telling us that the incredibly increasing rates of autism may be related to glyphosate now affecting some estimates as much as one in 40 uh, uh, kids that are born. I mean, these are, are individuals who are destined to require assistance for their entire lifetimes, one fortieth of our population. It's shocking numbers. The, all of this is shocking, and yet business as usual. I, I did a little um, Instagram clip from our hardware store a couple of weeks ago, walked in, they were having a sale, and they had the Roundup stacked to the ceiling. That's awful. And, you know, in my neighborhood, I watch people spraying it in their driveways. I, and I have that problem, too. <laughs> no gloves, no mask, nothing. Yes. it's. So and from disturbing. there, where does it go? Right. It was so, you know, and it sticks around a really long time in the environment. And that's coming out more and more as well. There's actually a lot of good news. I mean, good news from my standpoint. 
in the last few years, papers have been coming out left and right. I think finally people are realizing this chemical is not trivial. Because I think because we were told it was so safe, it was kind of stupid to study it, right? Because why waste your money studying something that's safe? But now that it's become clear that it's an endocrine disruptor, it has effects at very low levels, and it lasts a long time. And so Monsanto was kind of saying, you know, oh, it's so great because that, you get a lot of sunlight. Biodegrades. Biodegrades really quickly, gone in two weeks. You know, this is kind of the message we're hearing, both in our body and in the soil. It goes away very quickly. This is such a great chemical. Certainly not true. And, and in fact, there's a brand new study. Uh, just, I, I just heard about it a few days ago um, that in Canada where they, um, they studied glyphosate in the forest and they actually in the tissues of the trees in the forest and they had sprayed it like 12 years ago and it was still there. Yeah. So it lasts a huge long time under certain circumstances. Well, I think that we have to present what the paradigm is. One would think that here in, in America, that uh, certainly there is some due diligence done on, on these products before they're released upon the public. <laughs> and the reality is it's just the opposite. They are innocent until proven guilty, and it's up to people to show the risk. Things are released with no oversight. And... Um, you know, I mean, you think about what happened finally with lead. Uh, you know, it, it took so long, but finally it happened that we finally, the, the evidence was just so overwhelming that finally people did something. But, you know, I guess, you know, to me and to many of the other people who are listening, have our ear to the ground, the evidence right now with respect to glyphosate is profound and vast, and yet it continues on business as usual. I know. I, I don't know what it takes you know, to wake up the government. And I would think the government would be really concerned about this, especially the autism, because when those kids grow up, you know, if we have one in 40 with autism as adults, it's going to be a huge burden on this society. And then meanwhile, we'll have another crop of autistic kids coming up in the next generation. It's just, it's unthinkable that what that's going to look like. And, and for the government to not even notice that it's happening just is so puzzling to me. They, they should be spending every dime they can get on trying to figure out what's causing this autism. And in the book, of course, I write a lot about autism. That is where I started. And the more I look, the more it becomes so clear. You know, there's all these papers now, for example, on propionate. And uh, propionate is a, is a short-chain amino acid, I mean, short-chain fatty acid, that is produced in the, by the gut microbes and that is associated with autism in many different papers. That it, propionate, if you even put propionate into the brain of a, of a mouse, you, you get an autistic mouse. So it's very clear it's connected. Yeah, I think you're referring to the work of, of Dr. Derek McFabe in, uh, in Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've actually had him on the program and demonstrated those, um, those videos, well, which are quite compelling. And, and you know, uh, to be fair, propionate gets in, in all of our brains as one of the three major short-chain fatty acids. It's, it's more the ratio, and it absolutely right. gets right back to what you were talking about in terms of overgrowth of clostridial species, uh, with suppression of other species that would have otherwise created more of a balance in the short chain fatty acids, just based upon that that yeah, uh, and then weak they, link and in the, the chain, that shikimate pathway. Right, and they, it's been shown experimentally that glyphosate causes the gut to be acidic, and under acidic conditions, you, the gut microbes produce more propionate and they produce less butyrate. When you get a slightly, I mean, I'm sorry, it's basic. Glyphosate makes the gut too basic. So it's like 6.5 instead of 5.5. doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a huge difference. That is in huge. The pH in the gut. On a log and, scale? <laughs> yeah, and, it's, um, and it has a huge impact. And, and butyrate is what the uh, gut um, colonocytes, those uh, our cells that line the gut boundary, uh, depend on butyrate as a primary source of fuel. That's their, they love butyrate. And butyrate goes way down when the pH goes up. And that's just because which microbes like which pH. The guys that like the acid can't make, um, can't live because it's too basic. And then they're the ones who make the butyrate. When it gets basic, you get a lot of propionate. You get that imbalance. And then the propionate is very clearly connected to autism. So it, mm. it works very beautifully as far as glyphosate has been shown to cause the pH to go up. And then uh, um, the um, acetic acid, acetate, is, also goes down. So... Yeah, I think we're just beginning to look at um, the epigenetic uh, play of these of the shifts in the short chain fatty acid, how they may affect gene expression. Um, you know, you're very vocal, have been for years. Uh, you wrote a series of papers uh, uh, describing the mechanisms back in 2015 with correlations to autism and other autoimmune conditions, especially thyroid issues. Um, what kinds of pushback have you experienced over the years? 
<laughs> a lot. <laughs> I mean, I'm still labeled as a kook by some uh, some of the mainstream oh, good. folks. <laughs> we should have so, an annual meeting. Yes, it's uh, you know, uh, they just think I I'm just crying, you know, call it crying fire irresponsibly. I guess is the way to say it that I'm alerting people to a uh, problem that doesn't exist, and that I, that's bad because I'm you know misleading. It's basically what disinformation you call it, false news. <laughs> You know, but who's and, really manipulating the, the narrative here? I mean, we, we I see how the narrative, we saw it happen with sugar and fat uh, in terms of medical messaging. And now uh, we're seeing how aggressively uh, industry is manipulating the, the whole narrative surrounding glyphosate. And yet they've agreed to uh, what is the settlement uh, that they've allocated for the 100,000 uh, lawsuits. Uh, it's yeah, in the it's billions. a 10 billion, 10 billion. Um, they're trying to put together a settlement for $10 billion as a class action lawsuit. And I think it's still struggling. Is there still some issues that they haven't quite signed it yet? Mm -hmm. I think it's way too little. I mean, for the for what they've done. And they're hoping to get off the hook as far as setting up some committee that's going to study and is going to find that glyphosate is perfectly fine. And therefore, nobody can ever sue them again. They're hoping to set up something like that, and there's and the other side is seeing through that scheme and not letting them do that. As far as the last time I checked on that, it's hard to keep well, up with this political <laughs> game. But. What's it? What well, there was a fair amount of uh, literature that came out of, I believe, France showing the teratogenicity of glyphosate, with that literature subsequently being suppressed or at least uh, or buried or at least uh, derogated to some degree. Right. I mean, of course, it was it was actually very good timing for me when I first came back from that lecture. And then it was Seralini in France, Professor Seralini and his team. They've done some really great work. And, and they had just published a paper, which I read immediately after I got back from Don Huber's presentation. And that paper was really what really clinched it for me. It was like, OK, I'm going after this because it showed for the first time that low dose glyphosate over the lifespan of the rats caused all kinds of problems. And it, and it was interesting because after three months, the rats were doing okay. They, were do, they had a control group and the exposed group, and it was a low level of glyphosate, which in the past they'd always done high level of glyphosate. So they'd say, well, it's you know, ridiculously low, it's going to be perfectly fine, but it wasn't. So after three months, the rats were fine. They looked okay. After four months, they started to get sick. I mean, by the end of their life, they had a shortened lifespan. The, the, the females had massive mammary tumors. The males had uh, kidney problems and liver problems. They all had reproductive issues, shortened lifespan. I mean, it was a mess after the entire lifespan experiment. And that was when that was really kind of a holy cow experiment because that really exposed glyphosate as being uh, something you need to worry about at low levels. And, and I think that paper was a milestone because after that paper, there have been many, and more and more recently, as I said, there have been many papers that have started to look at glyphosate at low levels. They never did before. It was always very high levels. And it's, glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor. That's very clear at this point. And now all these papers are coming out and showing uh, disruption of the hormone systems and all kinds of problems. And even you know multiple generations, epigenetic effects that show up when the pregnant rat is exposed to glyphosate at small levels. It doesn't even hurt the rat. The pups are fine. By the second, third generation, you start to see all kinds of problems. It's really, really fascinating. Epigenetic effects where it goes straight for the um, ger germ cells in the fetus. So that's already the next generation. And those germ cells remember that exposure in utero. And then they act on it much later on and produce these offspring that have problems. You mentioned uh, in vitro study of human breast cancer cells being exposed to a dilution of glyphosate of one part per billion, which trillion, is a trillion. one one, well, I guess it was one drop in an Olympic-sized pool. Yes, right. That's tiny, quite a dilution, amounts. and yet it accelerated their growth. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it definitely encourages uh, cancer cells to grow. And there's another paper that showed that it uh, it's a primer. So when you have other known carcinogens, if you also have glyphosate, then those carcinogens become have their carcinogenic effect much faster in the presence of glyphosate. It's an enabler to cause other carcinogens to Context. kick in sooner. And that happens but, a lot with these chemicals. They really are synergistically toxic, which is another concern. We never study them in, in, in combination. You know, all the studies are in isolation. Well, well, that said, typically glyphosate is not really even generally available in and of itself. It's generally part yeah. of a, a mixture. So how does that affect uh, how it works in terms of some of the concerns? 
Yeah, and that's some of Seralini's studies have shown that the uh, formulation is hugely more toxic than, especially acutely toxic, that glyphosate by itself, uh, if, you have, if you design your experiment right, glyphosate can't get into the cells and you don't see much of an effect. But with, those, uh, with the formulations, they put other chemicals in there that enable the glyphosate to be taken up by the cells. And these are sort of chemicals that disrupt the cell membrane, open it up so the glyphosate can get in. And then those chemicals are toxic in and of themselves, and they make glyphosate much more toxic than it would otherwise be. And when Monsanto did its studies way back when, it only studied glyphosate in isolation. So they've learned how to make formulations over time that are more and more toxic to the weeds. So they've introduced new formulations of Roundup that have augmented you know, stuff in there that makes it more toxic to the weeds. And they're not thinking about, well, maybe they are, but they don't want to think about the possibility it might also make it more toxic to us, you know? I, I'm hopeful that our viewers are getting this because uh, th this needs to stop. I mean, we can't, we can't let this continue. This is, you know, as you mentioned, toxic to us, that's for sure. But the implications, at least of the rodent studies, in terms of what's going to happen to future generations, I think is, gosh, it's certainly uh, worrisome. Let me, let me shift uh, gears for a moment. And originally, uh, glyphosate was uh, developed as a uh, metal chelator. And I think you spent quite a bit of time in your book talking about uh, that there are some implications based upon how it chelates uh, metals uh, in terms of human health. So first, tell us what it means to chelate metals, and then let's relate it to some concerns. Right. It, it basically means that it binds very tightly to the metal and, and holds it so that it can't do what it would do, normally do. And we have all these minerals that we need in very small amounts, trace amounts of manganese and zinc and, and cobalt, you know, all these wonderful minerals that are, uh, and they're often, those minerals are both toxic and, uh, and deficient at the same time with glyphosate because glyphosate disrupts the whole transport system for how you manage them. The body has these sophisticated mechanisms you know, carrier molecules, like for example, heme carries iron, you know, and, and so, and you have um, cobalt, you know, cobalamin carries cobalt. So you have these different ways of um, taking these minerals and incorporating them into interesting molecules that can transport them and deliver them uh, where they need to go uh, effectively and safely. Because iron, of course, is, is very reactive if it's just out in the open, but then you have iron, you know, like ferritin, you have various um, molecules that specialize in transporting iron. To, and delivering it to the various uh, organ, uh, the organs and the various cells that need the iron to do their job. All these uh, enzymes that are ca these these minerals form are catalysts for various important enzymes, and uh, glyphosate basically binds really tightly to the enzyme, to the to the metal, and hangs onto it. And that also changes the metals. For example, aluminum I think is a very serious worry. Arsenic and aluminum, both of them, they're a plus three. They don't react. They stay at plus, plus three all the time. Other other guys. The ones that move around in their, in their um, oxidation state, the valence state from plus three to plus two, you know, like cobalt and iron, they have interesting um, properties that help to make reactions take place. But aluminum is basically inert in that sense. It can't make reactions take place, but it can really mess things up because of that plus three charge. And, um, and, it, and it gets into places and binds to things like it causes Alzheimer's disease. It's also linked to autism. You know, there was a study that showed high aluminum in the autistic brain. Uh, Chris uh, Exley, Chris Exley uh, had a really interesting paper about autism brains post-mortem where he showed uh, unusually high levels of aluminum in the brain. That's been linked to, to Alzheimer's as well very clearly. And so uh, I actually wrote a paper about, um, together with colleagues, about the idea that glyphosate is, is, is actually studies that show um, theoretically that glyphosate would wrap up, uh, two glyphosate molecules would, wrap, would hide the plus three charge of the aluminum atom. They would bind to the aluminum and form a circle around it like a cage. And that would make a neutral molecule that would be very easy to cross the gut barrier because the plus three charge interferes with the aluminum's ability to get past the barrier. Once you have the leaky gut and the aluminum molecule that no longer has the charge, it can get past much more easily and it can go into the brainstem and cause uh, disrupt the brainstem nuclei that way. And there was a paper that was published uh, from some, some Sri Lankan researchers who argued the same thing for arsenic being carried to the kidneys by glyphosate to cause kidney failure in agricultural workers in Sri Lanka. So it's a principle that's you know, applied to both of those metals, arsenic and aluminum, that have similar properties, that glyphosate basically, it drops it off when the, and when the pH goes down. So it carries it very tightly with the high pH, 
And then when the pH goes down at the terminal watershed in the kidneys and in the brainstem, uh, it drops it off. So both the aluminum and the glyphosate separated become very toxic at that point. So, Dr. Sin, uh, we live in southwest Florida. We are downstream from Lake Okeechobee. <laughs> I, you know where this is going. Uh, we're downstream from, from Big Sugar, uh, which mm -hmm. uh, uses a lot of glyphosate. I know. Uh, we're seeing uh, higher and higher levels of cyanobacteria, um, all, all kinds of issues that we've never seen before. What is going on and what is the risk that we are experiencing? Yes, it's very sad what's happening there because Florida has such a wonderful um, environment there for the birds and the, and the, um, the manatees and the dolphins. I mean, all these uh, wonderful species that are living in this now a very, very toxic environment. And I've been watching Florida for quite some time. Um, and I believe glyphosate's a major player in that whole mess that you're seeing there with the cyanobacteria. It's, in fact, I wrote uh, an article together with Jennifer Margulis. We published a, 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 an article on the web on the topic of those manatees, uh, which you, uh, you probably know the manatees are dying this year in record numbers in Florida. Um, the dolphins are also suffering from uh, actually Alzheimer's disease. They're getting dementia. And I think that those are both connected to the glyphosate. The glyphosate is used on the sugar cane. It's also used in the waterways to control um, invasive weeds. And it's used on the, on the uh, beautiful homes that have these gorgeous yards. They're using glyphosate too. And all that glyphosate is getting into the waterways. The cyanobacteria actually are really smart. They can completely metabolize glyphosate and use its phosphorus atom as a source of phosphorus. And that really promotes their growth. They, they're clearing the glyphosate in the process of growing. But then they're creating a, um, you know, a food source that really messes up the entire food chain. They, they block the sun because all this algae grows. You know, with the, the cyanobacteria provide nutrition. They make the ni nitrogen uh, sources that, that allow the algae to grow. And then you get this massive algae grow overgrowth, which blocks the sunlight. And then the plants underneath um, d can't get enough sun. They can't grow. But they're also being... Um, exposed to glyphosate as well. So the manatees eat these plants that can't grow because there's, the sunlight is blocked, but also because the plants are being exposed to glyphosate. And then the manatees are getting exposed as well, and they're getting sick and dying. It's a very, very sad story in a beautiful well, we, place. Well, uh, with... we, we have a manatee, or we have a family of manatees that lives right in, in I would say, our backyard, but right outside the seawall. Um, but you, you mentioned in the book how uh, one study demonstrated uh, that what may be related here is a chemical called BMAA right. uh, that is uh, produced by these cyanobacteria that's found to accumulate in uh, many of the uh, dolphins that are uh, dying and washing that's up right. on beaches when they post-mortem look at their brains. So, uh, you know, this BMAA has, there, there are some researchers and at least one clinician that I'm aware of, uh, they, that feel that BMAA may be playing a, a central role in things like Lou Gehrig's disease. Yes. Uh, I would say possibly contributes to Alzheimer's in humans, but uh, if you are a follower of Dr. Dale Bredesen, as am I, you realize there are many factors that can uh, tip the brain over to being a feed-forward uh, event as it relates to neuronal degeneration. Uh, but that said, um, in the just a couple minutes that we have left, Let's spin this so we can know what we can do. I mean, where do we start? What can we do to protect ourselves? And even more importantly, uh, after we're protected, then what can we do to support you and to get the word out that this has to stop? Right. Now, the obvious thing is to buy only certified organic food when you shop at the grocery store. And luckily in the United States, it's becoming more and more available. I've been watching Whole Foods. Luckily, we have a Whole Foods near our house and we buy almost all of our groceries there. We buy everything organic certified organic and their supply is getting bigger and bigger over time and that's really nice to see so we're getting the message the united states is not able to make enough uh, we have to import a lot of our certified organic food because our farmers are not producing it we need to fix that and i'm hoping that the farmers will start to see that first of all that they're getting sick because they're being exposed to these chemicals and then to think that if they could convert their farm to certified organic they could make they could sell their product for more money and they would be a lot healthier. And so I'm hoping that there will be motivation on the part of the farmers to change their ways through consumer demand. And so I think the best thing anybody can do personally is to switch to a certified organic, both for them, their own health and their family's health, but also for um, to encourage the farmers to grow certified organic food. Well, the, the threat of toxins on farmers, I think it w was talked about multiple times in, in the book, uh, 
But uh, the one that really I, I remember most is how, you, how your grandfather was found. Oh, that was so tragic. Yes, I remember that very well. I was 14 years old, and uh, he, uh, he was, so he had uh, a farm, and he grew peaches and, and apples. We went there several you know, times to visit. I always enjoyed his farm. They had pigs and peaches and apples, and it was quite fun. We would sell the fruit at the, at the apple stand on the highway and uh, you know it was a fun childhood experience for me but he was found dead on his tractor with a, a bag of DDT that had broken open and uh, that that was he and he was in his early 50s when that happened so that planted a seed in my brain at a very young age and then I read uh, Rachel Carson's book Silent Spring shortly after that it came out right around the time when I was 14 years old and I read that book and so I think that it had a deep deep impact on me the combination of my grandfather and that book was probably what led me to where I am today. Well, we're grateful that it did, uh, you know, that there's uh, an upside to that painful experience and, and uh, trying to right the wrong. Great to see you uh, again, and uh, congratulations on the, on the new book. And um, I'm certain this is going to really move the needle, and it needs to move the needle. And, you know, there, there's so many of you out there now um, that are working towards this goal. Uh, we've interviewed uh, Jeffrey Smith a number of yes, times. And, he's been great. You know, yeah, he's terrific. And um, I just want to thank you for joining us today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for the work you do to help to get the message out. Thank you. T talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, we learned quite a bit today, didn't we, about glyphosate. And, you know, you may wonder uh, what we do moving forward. I think Dr. Sen have certainly outlined an action plan for us, and I am going to uh, be on the side of the science on this one, indicating that I truly believe uh, that doing our best, for example, to buy organic foods and to continue uh, to do our very best to avoid exposure to glyphosate, especially as it relates to what we might use around our homes, is extremely important. I do believe, like Dr. Seneff, that this is a clear and present danger, a danger of significant importance, threatening not only uh, our lives directly, but the, uh, the whole vitality of the biosphere. So, hope you enjoyed the program today. I know I learned an awful lot. Thanks for joining me. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Bye for now. Thank you.